My name is Darcy Gector, and I'm a whitewater kayaker, kind of focus on expedition kayaking, so multi-day trips. I also own a whitewater kayak guiding business in Ecuador, and uh, our main business is in Ecuador. We also run some trips in the U.S. during our summer months. And um, I am recently have recently become an author. I just published a book called Amazon Woman, which is about becoming the first woman to kayak the Amazon River from source to sea. You're oh, fantastic. And we're going to be discussing all of this amazing stuff in a little bit more detail. But I'd love to go back to the start. What was life like for you growing up? Were you quite sporty? Were you quite outdoorsy? I was, yeah. I was not a kayaker. I didn't start kayaking until I was 19. But um, as a kid, I grew up in Aspen, Colorado. So there was tons of opportunity for outdoor activities. Uh, my dad was a ski patroller. And so we grew up on the mountain. My, my parents taught me how to ski when I was two years old. And uh, yeah, I was just always, you know, playing in the pond or trying to skateboard or climbing trees. You know, I love to be outdoors. And we had a lot of freedom as kids too. Growing up in a pretty small, safe town, our parents would basically kick us out the door in the morning and say, come back in time for dinner. And so definitely had a lot of adventures as a kid. Yeah. What did you want to do when you were little? Did you have any idea that you that you grow up to become, you know, kayaking would become your life? Um, I had no idea about that. I was, I would say, kind of maybe small minded, or I didn't think very big as a kid. And our the high school I went to was a half a mile away from the ski mountain where my dad was a patroller. And my what I really wanted to do was follow in his footsteps and become a ski patroller. And I thought, well, this is convenient. You know, I grew up here. I just move a half mile from the high school to the mountain and this will be perfect. And, uh, you know, I hadn't really imagined at all this life of travel that is what ended up happening to me. And uh, it kind of started because my parents were not too thrilled with this idea that I had to become a ski patroller. So they made me go to college, which was smart of them in hindsight, but I was pretty angry at them at the time. But I went away to college and it was there that I met people that were into traveling. And um, I met a friend who invited me to go kayaking in Nepal with him in my second year of college. And that's what really changed the direction of my life. It really opened my eyes to the world beyond Colorado and how many possibilities there were out there. Yeah. What was that like being in Nepal at 19 on this kayaking trip? It sounds incredible. It was pretty crazy because I had never left North America before. And uh, I remember, you know, Kathmandu is about as different from Aspen, Colorado, as you could possibly get. And I remember taking a taxi from the airport to my hotel and I stepped out and three guys were holding down a goat just in the middle of the street, killing it and uh, slaughtering, you know, prepping it, I guess, to eat. And, um, and then from that experience, I walked into my hotel room, which cost a dollar 25 per night. And it was just like, so insanely dirty, but I was 19. I had no money. So that was like my program. And yeah, it was honestly, it was a really hard trip because I wasn't a good kayaker and we were doing rivers that were too hard for me. There was a lot of like 35 hour bus rides involved and I got really sick and, but still like something clicked, you know, it was just amazing to see the culture and to get to meet some Nepalese people. And because we were doing these remote river trips, you know, some of them 10 days long, we really got to see a lot of places that I felt like some other tourists didn't get to see. And it made me sort of realize how lucky I was to potentially have this capability to travel in a different way, to meet people on a different level. And so even though, yeah, it was really hard, there was a lot of suffering, it definitely um, made something click in my brain that made me want to explore these kind of possibilities as much as I could. 19 years old, having this life-changing experience and then heading back to college, how did you move things forward either on the, you know, on the kayaking front and the adventure front? What sort of happened next? So that trip really motivated me to get better at kayaking. So when I had been kayaking about a year, maybe a little less than a year when I went to Nepal. And um, by that point in my kayaking career, I had finally figured out the combat role, which means like if you tip over in a rapid, you can right your kayak back up without having to swim free of your kayak. And this is a really important skill in kayaking. And so I finally had figured that out, but I truly had 
very little other skills. So I would tip over, you know, in a given day, I would probably tip over 50 or 60 times and roll up. And so when I got home, I really wanted to focus on uh, developing my kayaking skills so I could go enjoy these rivers a lot more. And then um, kind of what happened next was a bit of luck, you know, some of it bad luck, some of it good luck. But two years later, I bought a plane ticket to go back to Nepal because I wanted to go rerun these rivers and feel comfortable on them and try to explore some different harder rivers that I couldn't do before. But I was going to go by myself and the Maoist insurgency kind of kicked back up right about that time. And I was really wondering how smart it was to go by myself and go do this. And I was just explaining that to a friend and he said, oh, well, we're going kayaking in Ecuador. So if you just want to pl change your plane ticket, you can come with us. And I had six weeks off. I had planned for this Nepal vacation or trip. And um, so I just changed my ticket to Ecuador. I literally didn't know where Ecuador was. I had to look on a map to figure it out. But I just said yes to this opportunity. And um, that's when I met Don Beveridge and Larry Ramirez, who at that time owned Small World Adventures, the company that I eventually ended up working for and now that I own. And so, yeah, that was, you know, I was definitely bummed out that I couldn't go back to Nepal, but it ended up opening so many doors that I never would have imagined. And I'd love to know, at that point in the world of kayaking, were there any sort of female role models in, in the sport? Were you aware of any other women doing kayaking? So, yeah, there were there were very few women running sort of the hardest rivers out there at that point. But the few that were really stood out, uh, like Nikki Kelly, who is from New Zealand. She was one of the women like really pushing the limits, doing all of the hard class five runs that the, the boys were doing. And a woman named Shannon Carroll um, actually set the world record for waterfalls around that time. And so, yeah, there weren't many, but the ones that were out there were uh, really kind of these shining beacons for me. And, you know, unfortunately, I never got to paddle with any of them at that time, but I definitely always looked to them like, okay, this is possible. This is really cool what they're doing, and I'm going to keep working towards it. Tell us more about Ecuador. What was that like, you know, six weeks over over in Ecuador and not knowing that actually this would change the direction of your life going forward? I pretty immediately loved Ecuador, um, although it, it was pretty challenging, too. I had taken Spanish classes in high school, and so I sort of naively thought, like, oh, I can speak Spanish. This will be fine. And I remember I got to Quito and I wanted to take the bus to the Equator Monument. And so I walk out and I get on the bus and I tell the bus driver in my Spanish where I want to go. And then I just remember I could not understand one single word that he said back to me. And I was like, oh, man, I definitely don't speak Spanish. This is going to be so hard. <laughs> so it was kind of like a really fun adventure in that part, even before I got to the rivers because it was just trying to get better at Spanish. And now I actually had a, a motivation to want to speak the language. And um, yeah, everyone in Ecuador, the people there are so nice and they're so welcoming. And everywhere I went, um, people were super helpful and just made the traveling really enjoyable. And then when I got to the rivers, like, Ecuador has more rivers per square mile than any other country on earth. So I was just kind of blown away how every time you would drive 10 miles, you would get to some another another amazing river. And I was pretty immediately taken with the whole river situation there. And yeah, I just got lucky because um, at that time, there was a woman named Melody working at Small World Adventures, and she was leaving to go get her PhD in entomology. And so at the end of my trip, Larry, who was the owner at that time, asked me if I wanted to come guide for the company. And he told me I could go home and think about it. But at that time, I was living in Montana and I was uh, I had a construction job that was outdoors in the Montana winters. And I just thought that spending the winters kayaking in Ecuador sounded a lot better. So I said, yes. What's guiding like? Like, how does that how does that work? Is it, you, you know, expedition after expedition? Do you get much time off? Like, how is it leading groups of people? Um, so, yeah, we don't get any time off. I mean, our season is four months long in Ecuador. So we kind of just put our heads down and work really hard for those four months, but people come for a week. So we kayak with them for seven days and uh, yeah, we don't, like, we finish with one group on a Saturday afternoon and start with the next group on a Sunday morning. So no time off, but we're pretty good at the endurance part of it now, I think. And it's really actually quite fun because most of the kayakers that come down there, they're already pretty good kayakers and they just want us to 
facilitate their trip because they don't speak Spanish. They don't know the runs. So we just get to show these already good kayakers down the rivers of Ecuador, which is really awesome. And we do some courses where we're actually teaching skills and stuff like that. But sometimes people say, I don't want to learn. I just want to follow you. Show me the river, show me the culture and let's go have a good time. So yeah, it's really, I'm quite fortunate because it's a very enjoyable job. You have become the first and only woman to kayak the Amazon River from source to sea. Take us back to when that dream first started, when you got the idea and how it's evolved. So it wasn't actually my idea, but the story behind that is pretty cool. It was um, a guy named David Midgley, who I'll just call Midge. That's his nickname that he goes by. But he is a very brilliant computer programmer from London and he was having a little bit of a midlife crisis in his early 30s, and he was worried that he would waste his entire life sitting behind a computer writing code. And so he thought he would feel better if he did one big adventure. And he um, he's like very analytical, very research and data driven. So he did a bunch of searching and he discovered two things. He discovered that no one had ever kayaked the Amazon from source to sea. And when he was um, figuring this out, five people had descended the entire river, but all of them had either walked or rafted all of the white water. And so no one had ever kayaked it. And then he also read that more people had walked on the moon than had descended the Amazon from source to sea. And he just found this so cool that he decided that would be his adventure, but he had never kayaked before in his life. Um, he had never gone camping and he really was like a, about as unprepared as you could possibly be to do something like this. But he started training and he actually trained for an entire decade. And I met him because he started coming to Ecuador. Um, you know, he read our website and saw that we did anything from beginner trips to class five trips. And there's um, a lot of class five in the whitewater or sorry, in the Amazon's headwaters. And so he started coming to Ecuador so that Don and I could train him to become a class five kayaker because he really wanted to do the whole thing. And so, yeah, for me, it started just as like a training mission to help this guy get ready to do it. And then eventually he invited us to join him for the whitewater because he knew he would need help there. And then that morphed into us joining him for the whole trip. When that option came about, how did you feel about it? You know, I mean, I'd, I'd love for you maybe just to give some some stats about the length, how long we were going to be out there, how much it was going to cost, be, being able to take that time off work. How would that all fit in with, with your plans? So this is a, a complicated question that might have a long answer. So feel free to cut me off. No, I want you to share. I want you to share it all. I'm ready. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK. So the Amazon, it's about four thousand three hundred miles long. It ended up taking us 148 days, so just shy of five months. Um, I So the way it came about is Midge first invited Don and I to do the whitewater, and that was going to be about a month. And for us, that was like an easy yes. Um, you know, he was going to pay for all of it, so we have a, a fully funded trip to kayak, uh, you know, the whitewater in the Peruvian Andes. That sounded pretty cool. And then in one night, actually, Don said to me, you know, are you, Darcy, are you really going to be okay saying goodbye to Midge after the whitewater? And you realize you'll be walking away from a chance to become the first woman to kayak the Amazon. And after he said that to me, I, you know, started thinking about it. And um, I, I talk about this a bit in the book, but I am like a very flippant decision maker. So kind of as he was saying that my wheels started turning and I just thought, yeah, why not? kayak the whole Amazon. And so I basically had made up my mind as Don is telling me to think about this. Don is an extremely meticulous decision maker and he'll think through every option, every possible outcome and be very slow to make a decision. So as soon as I decided, he was already backpedaling saying, whoa, 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 you know, think this through. Are you sure this is going to be a whole crazy thing? But once it got in my mind, I became pretty quickly determined to do it. And, um, Logistically, the way that it worked out, so in 2012, uh, it was me, Don Beveridge, and Larry Vermeeren that owned Small World Adventures. And one of our clients had come to us after a couple trips and said, hey, I want to change my life. I want to buy your business and start running kayaking trips. And the three of us decided that it was sort of a minor miracle that someone actually wanted to buy our business. So we sold to him with the idea that we would keep working for him. And so 
Um, we finished one year of the contract with him. We had a contract to train him and work for him for two years. We finished one year and then, yeah, we weren't sure if he was going to allow us to kind of get out of or be late on the contract. Cause we knew the expedition was going to start in July and it would probably finish sometime in December. Our season in Ecuador is November to March. So we would definitely miss part of the season. And we just approached the new owner with this opportunity we had, and he was, extremely supportive and said, yeah, go for it. This sounds like an awesome opportunity. So that was all good. But then what actually ended up happening between him saying that and the expedition was that him and I had a few disagreements about business stuff and he ended up firing me. And then also by extension, Don, just like about a month or two months before we left for the expedition. So Don and I were you know, in a way kind of lost because this business had been like our career, our identity, our only form of income for a decade or so. And, but it, on the other hand, it was like also a great time to start a big expedition because we had like zero attachments, no home, no job. It was like kind of a starting over. And uh, the financial side of it was that Midge was paying for everything. So that made it obviously really easy for us. We didn't have to worry about any finances. So yeah, even though the firing was definitely like a bummer for us, we uh, it ended up being a great way to uh, head off into the wilderness to start anew. Oh my god, I'm just getting so excited! <laughs> <laughs> just, I mean, obviously, I know it must be you know heartbreaking getting fired. It's, it's never pleasant, um, right? But then suddenly you've got this all expenses paid. Midge, what a legend! Um, yes, you know, trip down the Amazon. Now you said that you're quite a flippant uh, sort of decision maker, and Dom's maybe more analytical. And obviously, you talked about Midge sort of doing all the coding, so very sort of analytical. Tell me more about what was involved in your planning and preparation to get ready for this challenge. Uh, yeah, the logistics for a trip this long are are pretty insane, and. Um, it was, it ended up being kind of funny from, because from 1950 until about 2012, the entire geographic world agreed that the Aparimac river in Peru was the source of the Amazon. And so, um, Midge, you know, in his decade long of planning, he did, um, a lot of research, a lot of studying around the Aparimac river. And he actually had even gone to Peru and rafted some sections of it to kind of get a feel for the white water and see how it was. And he had topographic maps of the entire river. But then um, about one year before our expedition, a guy named Rocky Contos discovered that the Montaro River in Peru was actually 47 miles longer. So it became the new source of the Amazon because they define it as, you know, the most distant tributary from the mouth of the river. And so, uh, you know, we had especially Midge, but all of us had done so much research on the Aparimac. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, chuck all that out the window. We're shifting to a new river. And we really didn't have a ton of information except that Rocky, who discovered that it was longer, he did the first descent of that river about a year before ours. And he told us like, it's all manageable. You know, he said, you can scout when you need to scout and you can run what you can't scout. And, you know, you guys can go figure it out. So Having the knowledge that somebody else had successfully run it was was certainly helpful. And then other logistical things was just like Don and Midge brought 50 days worth of dehydrated meals with them to Peru in these giant duffel bags. And I brought about 80 days worth because I'm a vegan. So I thought it would take longer for me to be able to find sources of food than than those guys. And um, we also we started the trip in whitewater kayaks and ended in sea kayaks. So we had to get uh, the kayaks swapped out partway through. And um, yeah, it was truly kind of insane logistics. And we we kind of did as much as we could before the trip, but we still ended up having to do a ton while we were kayaking down the river. Like we brought a satellite phone with us and quite frequently at night at camp, we'd have to get out the phone and you know see how things were going with the shipping of the sea kayaks and just some other logistical problems. And for the training, you know, Don and I, like our lives were kind of good training for this kind of thing because we we guided kayakers in Ecuador during the winter. So that meant about 120 days on the water every winter. And then in the summer, we were either kayaking for fun or leading trips in the Grand Canyon or in Idaho. So we were quite physically fit for the kayaking. And um, it's kind of fun for me to talk a little bit about Midge's training because he was 
you know, trying to transform himself into this class five expedition kayaker, which is quite hard to do. You know, I would say of all the kayakers in the world who start out kayaking, maybe only five or 10% get to this elite level. And he knew that he had to do that if he was going to survive the whitewater. And he really wanted to be able to run all the whitewater. And so he wanted to get fit. So he just started signing up for marathons to force himself to get fit. And he found kayaking really, really scary. And so he's trying to think of something scarier than kayaking and he's afraid of heights. So he took up skydiving because he knew that that would be scarier for him than kayaking and would help somehow put kayaking in perspective. Like, Oh, it's not that bad. It's not as scary as skydiving. And he did like jungle survival courses. And, uh, you know, I've never before or since I have never met someone who dedicated themselves so much to a goal as Midge did. And he, he succeeded, you know, in the end he pulled it off. He paddled, the entire Amazon river. And it's, you know, really, uh, to me, like such a cool example of what humans can accomplish if they're really dedicated. I'd love to know from, from your perspective, were there many sort of naysayers, the, the, the negative Nellies as such, you were sort of saying, look, you can't do that. Let's, let's think through the dangers. You're going through the Amazon. It's never been done before. There's going to be illegal loggers. There's going to be drug dealers. There's going to be rebels. There's going to be poachers, you know, there's going to be like a lot of risks involved in undertaking a challenge like this. How did you balance the risk and reward? Like how did you plan for the potential obstacles and challenges that you would face? I guess for most of my life, I've been dealing with naysayers because I always have liked to do things that aren't normal for girls or women to do, or especially like I'm pretty small, so aren't normal for small women to do. And So, you know, I've been hearing like, you can't, you shouldn't for so long. And I feel really lucky that, you know, even though it it definitely affects me, but my reaction is to like get mad and get determined to prove them wrong. And so that was kind of the same thing on the Amazon when people started saying, you know, you shouldn't do this, it's too dangerous. But this was the Amazon trip was the first time in my life that a little part of me was like, maybe these people, maybe there's something behind what they're saying, because this is a really dangerous part of the world. And the red zone in Peru, which is where the flat water started, um, six tourists that we knew of had passed through there in the two years prior to our expedition. And two of them had gotten murdered and one more had gotten shot, but survived. And so like we weren't facing good odds and there were, you know, obvious dangers that we needed to overcome. And So what we did, you know, particularly for that region was um, the the local indigenous people there are called the Ashanika, and they very rightfully so are kind of fearful of outsiders and protective of their land. And for the last 200 years, the government has not helped them in any form to fend off, you know, Shining Path terrorists, illegal loggers, um, drug traffickers. And so they very much had to take their own safety into their own hands. And so one thing, probably the best thing that we did was we got permission letters from them and they have like two overarching bodies or organizational bodies. And so we got organ, uh, sorry, permission letters from both of those groups. And basically what those serve to do is alert them what we were doing, you know, what was our goal? You know, we're just traveling through. We don't want to take anything from them. We don't want to stay And um, those ended up being awesome because people, you know, the reason that they're kind of suspicious or feel fearful is they don't know what our intentions were. So with these letters, you know, these towns, all the villages there still have a a guard 24-7 at their beach. And that's like a leftover from the Shining Path era, which was in the 1980s and 1990s in Peru. And so we would stop. We'd meet the guard stop, show them our permission letters, show them our passports. And as soon as they read over everything, they were always extremely welcoming, like asked if we need food, do we want to camp on their beach? And so that was a huge help and probably the thing that helped us the most. We also, um, again, back to the logistics, we, once we finished the whitewater, we had a motorized canoe come with us through this red zone with a local boat driver. And so our hope was you know, we were speaking Spanish as a second language, the Ashanika are speaking Spanish as a second language. So we were hoping by having a local, they could 
kind of help uh, ease any tensions in communication, again, explain what we were doing. And I still, you know, even with everything that we put in place, I still didn't feel totally comfortable with it and debated basically all through the whitewater if it was worth the risk of paddling through the red zone. And um, I can't say that I actually made a decision that it was, that I felt okay with it. I just kind of kept paddling until I was there. And then we started having more and more good experiences, which made me feel more comfortable about it. And in the end, you know, we definitely got lucky, I'm sure is one part of it. But I do think that our preparations helped as well. Yeah. How was it being um, the only woman on the team? It was fine. I mean, I'm pretty used to being the only woman in groups of, you know, kayaking particularly. Um, Now there are tons more badass female kayakers, which is awesome. But for, you know, I've been kayaking, I guess, 22 years now. And for most of that time, it was always me and a group of guys. And so I've, you know, become really comfortable in that situation. Um, but I did, before we got to the red zone, I went to a, a hair cutter place and had the lady cut off all my hair. Like one, it was one inch long when she was done because I just somehow thought if we were a group seen as a group of three guys in the red zone, that maybe we would be seen as less of a target to people. And, um, I don't know how much that worked, but I do know that when we got to villages and started talking with the people, as soon as they realized that I was a woman, it actually really put them at ease for some reason. You know, maybe they saw us as less of a threat because they knew that they had a, that we had a woman in the group. And so, yeah, I'm not sure if the haircutting worked or not, but it made me feel better at the time. Yeah, I remember I went uh, backpacking around South America and I was blonde at the time and my parents weren't really that comfortable with me um, heading over there to go traveling when I didn't speak Spanish. I was like, you know, really white blonde. So my compromise was to dye my hair. Um, like a brown color <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you know I, I'm not again you know similar to you I'm not sure it made any difference but psychologically it felt as though I you know I'd blend in a little bit more yeah exactly you've written you've written an incredible book a book about kayaking you know the largest river from the source to the sea and I know that there's good there's a huge amount of memories and moments throughout there but I'd love to for you just to share maybe one of those magical moments that that really stand out and I know that's a difficult question when it's over 3,000 uh, 3,000 plus miles more sorry 4,000 plus miles yeah, no worries <laughs> yeah it's so hard you know people are often like what was it like and it's like oh it was so it was like so many different things but yeah I definitely have a few standout moments and um, one of them maybe the most special came on about day 135 maybe and at this point we're in the the tidal zone so tides come up the amazon river more than 600 miles and it's also constantly windy like an upriver wind so if we stop paddling for one second we would get forcefully blown back up the river and so it was kind of like every single mile was hard earned at this point and um we, we had a support boat, boat, too, that we would meet up with every night, and we were trying to get to our meeting point, but we were quite late, and it got dark, and we didn't normally paddle at night because it just felt too dangerous for a variety of reasons, but we were in this tiny little side channel, and it felt okay, so we just kept going in, into the night, and as soon as it got really dark, um, we started noticing that every time we take a paddle stroke, the like our paddle blades would kind of glow this greenish color and then we'd dip our hands in the water and the same thing and we realized it was the bioluminescence from you know the little saltwater critters in the water like emitting their light when we were disturbing the water and so that was like such a cool moment because number one it was a really awesome thing to see but number two we really felt like we were getting close because the water was salty enough that this was happening and maybe one other moment, and this I guess this one wasn't a moment, but um, the first people that ever descended the Amazon Source to Sea did it in 1985. And Joe Kane was one of the people, he wrote a book called Running the Amazon. And he talked about seeing uh, the pink Amazonian river dolphins, but he also talked about how they were going extinct and they're becoming more and more rare to see. And so I was really hoping that we would see one dolphin on our trip. And we saw the first one on day 30 of the expedition. And then we saw them almost every day till the end. And it was so nice because, you know, flat water paddling definitely gets monotonous. And being with the same three people 24 hours a day for five months gets monotonous. 
but kind of every day if I was having a low moment or bummed out or bored, like eventually we'd see these dolphins and they were, they're so ungainly. They're so weird. They make up fart sound when they surface, like, (laughs) but they're just like added this lightness to the trip. And yeah, they were so cool to see. What was a typical day like for you? What time were you waking up? What was, um, you know, were you stopping for lunch? How long were you paddling for? What was your particular role um, as part of the team? So, yeah, we, it's basically 12 hours of daylight, 12 hours of darkness, you know, give or take a little bit for the whole time we were on the Amazon. And so we, especially at the beginning, we were trying to paddle most of the daylight hours. And um you can delete this part out if it's not appropriate for the podcast, but the bugs were really bad, particularly the sand flies, and they would come out at first light. So we always tried to get up a little bit before first light so that we could go to the bathroom before the sand flies got too bad because that was unpleasant if you mistimed that. Oh, no, um, we'll, keep, we'll keep that in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we'd get up a little before daylight, which was probably like 4.30 in the morning or maybe a little bit later. And then we'd make a dehydrated meal, go kayaking. And when we were in the whitewater, we pretty much kayaked like eight to 10 hours a day. And we would take a break for lunch, although we didn't, all we ate for lunch was cliff bars, but you know, just take a little rest and then kayak until maybe an hour before dark. So we would have time to cook dinner in the daylight and set up camp and all that. And then um, when we got to the flat water, Midge was starting to get worried about getting tendonitis or getting some other um, like overuse injury that might not allow him to accomplish his goal. So he wanted to only kayak six hours a day. And that was a little bit hard because with 12 hours of daylight and not much else to do, it was kind of hard to sit around for so much time. But um, we did that for a while. And then he eventually felt comfortable adding more time back into the day And then when we hit the tides, like eventually the tides got so strong that we could no longer paddle against them. So we would try to paddle all of the daylight hours where the tide was going out. And then we'd just have to sit around when the tide was coming in. And in terms of our roles, um, you know, Don is definitely the strongest whitewater paddler of the three of us. So he did a lot of leading in the whitewater and maybe I did the second most leading, but basically like Dawn and my job in the whitewater was to do everything we possibly could to help Midge survive it all. And then in the flat water, you know, I did a lot of logistical stuff, uh, phone calls. I would say Midge did most of the pre-trip logistical planning and I did most of the during the trip logistical dealings. And um, yeah, we all kind of flopped around like how much we were feeling dejected or trying to motivate the other teammates and it worked it worked out pretty well because when I would be having a low day, Don would encourage me on. And when I would be really mad at Midge, Don would try to tell me to to relax a little bit. And so I think, you know, we definitely had our our low moments and our fighting. But overall, as a team, we did a pretty good job of balancing each other out. For, for those eight to ten hours a day of when you were kayaking, what were you thinking about? What was going through your head? I mean, was it an opportunity to, uh, I haven't done kayaking, but I've done a, a lot of long hikes and I've always found, you know, having sort of alone time is this amazing time to think and reflect and, you know, on life, on the past on what's happened and, you know, sort of plan for the future or dream about the future. What was going through through your head during those, you know, eight to 10 hours a day of paddling? Yeah, well, when we were in the whitewater, like it was hard enough that it demanded enough focus that, you know, wasn't thinking about much besides figuring out the rapids and how to safely move downstream. But when we got to the flat water and it was, yeah, there was nothing to do besides think. Um, you know, I tried a lot to think about what would, what would be coming next in life because, you know, again, Don and I had no more job, no more company. And, we really wanted to figure out, or I really wanted to figure out what was next, but Don was like still mad at me for getting us fired. And he, he's a bit older than I am. And he had this feeling like, I don't have any other skills. What am I going to do? And he wasn't all that interested in discussing. So that would cause some fights between us when I would try to be like, come on, we could be physical therapists or something. He would kind of tell me to go away and, uh, go back to whatever he was doing. But, you know, it was an interesting time about that. I had also kind of convinced myself that 
because of all these big changes in our life that the Amazon might be like the perfect last adventure because people all the time were asking us when, when were we going to settle down? When would we stop playing around all the time and get a real job? And didn't we want security for our future and all that kind of stuff? So, you know, even though I personally didn't really want any of that stuff, I definitely had begun to feel like, Oh, what's wrong with me for not wanting this stuff. So I spent a lot of time trying to, figure that all out. And basically what I concluded in the end, you know, everything that I thought that I could do as a career, as a a real job quote, um, you know, it wasn't, there was like no passion behind it. It was like, I could suffer through this. I, I could force myself to do this. And so, yeah, after five months of thinking it through for 12 hours a day, I, decided that I really shouldn't be so bothered by what other people think, by what society thinks, and just keep on doing what makes me happy. Oh, my God, absolutely. (laughs) I was always getting a bit concerned, where's this going now? I was like, no, you've got the best life ever. (laughs) What was it like finishing, you know, getting to the end, completing the, the journey? You know, take us back to that moment. So when we started the expedition, we put in a little waypoint marker in Midge's GPS and we had looked at maps and looked at where like the northernmost shore of the Amazon stuck out into the ocean and where the southernmost shore stuck out into the ocean. And it's like almost 200 miles wide there. And so we just picked a point about two miles off the southern bank that we felt was like sticking out between uh, beyond those two points of land. And so when we were finishing, um, we had, we slept out at a place that was 10 miles from the end. At that point, the conditions were so rough. You know, the waves were like 10 or 15 feet tall and it was super windy. It it took us six hours to paddle those 10 miles. And um, when we got past the point, it was so rough that like we couldn't even stop and high five or have any kind of celebration. So it was just kind of paddle, paddle, paddle oh, we we made it. Yay. And then we turned and we paddled our two miles into shore. So like the actual moment was kind of uh, not so celebratory because we were just sort of fighting to keep our kayaks upright and and not swim and not have some disaster after we had made it. But then when we got to shore, we had a white sand beach, no people anywhere in sight, like no other land in sight. And we had this amazing sunset and it was both like a really awesome feeling because we we had done it, you know, especially for Midge, 10 years of his life, 10 years of training had culminated in that moment. And it felt so good. But all three of us also had the feeling of what are we going to do tomorrow? Because for five months, like life had been boiled down to the simple common goal, of just paddle to the Atlantic. And then it was just a real shock when we actually finished that because it was like tomorrow we have no purpose, we have no meaning. And so it definitely took a while to sort of get back on track. And basically what it took for me was creating some new goals that I could start focusing on to sort of feel happy and content again. What new goals did you come up with? So two things that immediately came to mind. I Since I began kayaking, I was learning from some people that um, had kayaked this Grand Canyon of the Stikeen River in northern British Columbia. And people call it the Everest of rivers. And it's this three day big water run in a sheer walled canyon, really remote from everything. And so I had wanted to do that for a long time, but I just wasn't sure if it was accessible to me, if I could ever get good enough to do it or not. But after that Amazon, like after seeing you know, when Midge decided he would kayak the Amazon, it was definitely not accessible for him. I would have said it was totally impossible, but he made it happen. And so he was like a good motivator to like a kick in the butt to me, like I can make this happen. And so that was one goal. The other one was going to kayak um, the Boschkaus River in Siberia in the Altai Mountains. And um, they have from the first people that ran that river, which tragically, a number of them didn't make it, but they put this book up in the cliff and they call it the book of legends. And so now any river runner that kayaks this river in Siberia will climb the cliff and write their name into the book of legends. And so 
those became the two goals that I focused on. And Don and I did them both in 2016. So that was like a cool, for me, like follow up and maybe a couple adventures that were sort of inspired from that Amazon trip. I love that so much. That's amazing. Tell me more about the book and how and why you decided to put it down to paper to share the story. Yeah, the, my main motivation, um, you know, I said before, like I have sort of faced a lot of my life of people telling me, no, I can't do stuff. And even really silly examples, like I was, there's a, there was a dam releasing water into a class five big water run. And as I'm, you know, trying to like mentally prepare myself and getting dressed, there's like this commotion in the parking lot. And I noticed that the dam keeper is running across the parking lot to come and ask me if I really feel like I'm up for it. And it was a woman, actually. She said, you're so little and there's really big rapids down there. Are you sure you want to do this? And, you know, these kind of things, like, they can be anywhere from annoying to devastating, you know, depending on who it's coming from and my state of mind and everything. But, you know, I'm definitely not the only one that faces this kind of thing. But like I said, I do feel lucky that my instinct is to, you know, get determined to prove these people wrong. But I wanted to share my story to hopefully encourage other people to not listen to kind of the noise of the world like this when they're getting negative feedback from people that don't know them, that don't know their skills, their dreams, their determination level, anything like that. Because it it can be easy to let this stuff, you know, sort of affect you, whether it's, uh, it could be on different levels. It could just be subconsciously, or it could be outright. Maybe people say, you're right. I can't do this. I'll go home. But I just really want to, to sort of share my stories, share the message that don't listen to this kind of stuff. Don't let other people's judgments direct the course of your life. And, you know, if you're willing to work hard, you can accomplish anything. Oh, absolutely. Did you film any of the of going down the Amazon River? Is there any film footage or documentary or anything? There is. Um, so there's no documentary. We didn't have a film crew or anything. Like Midge didn't want any sponsors or any film crew. He just wanted to make sure that he wasn't beholden to anyone and that he was doing this for his own pure reasons. And so the three of us had GoPro cameras and We filmed as much as we could, but especially in the whitewater, you know, we, it was kind of felt unsafe to leave one person on shore while two people ran. So we didn't get a ton of footage, but if people go to amazonwoman.net, there's like a links to media and there's a couple of videos online that are, you know, seven and 10 minutes long and just kind of give a feel for what the expedition was like. What has life been like since? So you know, you you finished uh, the Amazon run. You've you've done your you did your two big goals in in 2016 and signed in the book of legends. And you know, you've written this incredible book. What what is life like for you for you now? Where are you based? What are you doing? So in 2016, um, Don and I bought Small World Adventures back. You know, it's kind of a little bit funny in hindsight. The guy that bought the company, you know, he is also a really smart engineer and he was uh, working for Apple, but wanted to get out of that life and kind of back to the river life. You know, once he fired us, I thought, okay, we need to get out of the river life and into, you know, normal society. And I think for both of us, this massively changing our lives just didn't work out. And so after a few years, this guy decided that the business wasn't for him. Don and I really missed it. And um, we hadn't, we hadn't come up with some next great plan. We had started a new kayak guiding business and we were running trips in Bhutan and Africa, but we wanted to go back to Ecuador. We both really missed Ecuador. So anyway, we bought the business back in 2016. So we're still doing that in the winters. Um, the book writing for me was a really huge challenge, actually and very time consuming for me because I didn't, you know, like I didn't have any clue what a literary agent was when I started the process and I had no idea how to get published. So it was, that was, you know, like a very different kind of adventure, but a fun and very challenging one as well. And so, yeah, now we're still doing Ecuador in the winter. This summer, this spring and summer, we had planned a big book tour because the book was released March 3rd, but obviously the coronavirus had um, other plans. So now, yeah, I've just tried to like 
focus on trying to do internet stuff, more, more podcasts, more virtual book talks and book clubs and stuff. And that's like been a whole new adventure because I'm not very good at internet marketing, but I'm definitely learning a lot. Absolutely. Well, you're brilliant <laughs> yes. at storytelling, which is fantastic. And Darcy, <laughs> where would be the best place for people to follow along, to buy your book, to find out more information about you? Um, so probably starting at the amazonwoman.net is the best place. Um, I do have Facebook and Instagram, Darcy Gector. Of course, my last name is really hard to spell, but it's uh, G-A-E. C H T E R. And yeah, I try to keep keep fairly up to date with new adventures, new book stuff and all that all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And before we go, I'd love for you just to leave our listeners with final words of wisdom, final words of advice to encourage other women other oh my god, let me say this again. <laughs> before we go, I'd love for you just to leave our listeners with final words of advice, final words of wisdom for other women and men out there who want to take on a massive challenge you know to to go and achieve something truly epic what advice would you have for them uh, I think the mindset is huge and I would say probably the biggest thing I learned on the Amazon expedition was how um, you know relatively small tweaks in my attitude my mental outlook could make a such a huge difference on my experience and I would say that is true for the training part of it you know if you can if you kind of think, oh, maybe I'll do this big adventure, then like your heart, your mind won't really be in it. But if you tell yourself you are going to do it, then I think you'll be more motivated. Getting out of bed at four in the morning to go train will feel that much easier because you have this goal. You know that you're doing it. And then once you get out there, once you get started, you know, like you're probably going to fail a little bit. Things aren't going to go as planned. There's going to be obstacles, frustration, setbacks. But, you know, just having a positive mental outlook can make all of that kind of acceptable. You know, it can be like not a disaster. Oh, it's just a puzzle. I have to figure out and move on. And once I realized that on the Amazon, I, I just had such a better time. I, you know, didn't get upset when things went wrong. It was like, OK, things are going wrong again. That's all right. How are we going to deal with it? And so, yeah, all the physical training in the world can only get you so far like the the mental side of it is huge and so I would encourage people to focus on that as well and just one more plug for my earlier message of don't let society's judgments of you change what you want to do once you know what you want to do just go for it and it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks Darcy, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about your incredible life your and, and your incredible journey about kayaking the Amazon River from the source to the sea. It's been absolutely inspiring and it's going to be amazing to follow along with all of your future adventures and challenges. All right. Thanks, Sarah. It was really fun talking to you and thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for listening to that episode with Darcy. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go check out the main website for more information out about me, the Tough Girl podcast, Tough Girl Challenges, and more information about our previous guests. If you are particularly into kayaking, I'm just going to give you a few podcast recommendations of women who've come on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about their experiences of kayaking. So you can take a listen to Laura Kennington, who comes on and shares more about kayaking in Russia. Anna Blackwell has shared more about kayaking the continent, 4,000 kilometers, kayaking from England to the Black Sea through 11 countries. Sarah Davis has been on the Tough Girl podcast twice. She shared more about paddling the length of Australia's longest river, the Murray River, as well as sharing more about her expedition down the Nile. Larry Davis has been on and she shares more about being a kayaker, a Euro European freestyle champion and adventure who's paddled in some of the remotest parts of the world. So there is loads of amazing women sharing more about kayaking but I've also spoken with mountaineers, runners, ultra runners, cyclists, women who've cycled around the world, climbed Mount Everest, uh, sailed around the world, they've swam the English Channel, they've run barefoot, they've 
done stand-up paddleboarding. There's a whole variety of different women doing amazing challenges and adventures. And the whole mission is to increase the amount of female role models in the media, especially in relation to adventure and challenge. And the reason I'm able to produce these podcasts is due to the financial support of patrons. If you'd like to find out more about supporting the Tough Girl podcast and supporting my mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media, then please do go and visit patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. When you visit that website, there'll be a number of different options that you can subscribe to. You can subscribe from $2 per month, $5 per month, $10 per month. There are actually six levels going all the way up to $25 per month. You know, it just depends on what it is that you can afford and how much value that you are getting from the Tough Girl podcast and how much you would like to pay it forward. All female patrons, $5 and above, are invited to join the closed Facebook group, The Tough Girl Tribe. And all patrons will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website. Just want to say a massive thank you again for tuning in and subscribing. It really does make a massive difference. If you could tell one friend about the Tough Girl podcast, that would be fantastic. But wherever you are, whatever you are doing, just give it your all. Go for it. Just take one step forward today, which is going to bring you closer to achieving your dreams and goals. I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode of the Tough Girl podcast. Take care, lots of love, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye.